Hello. Um, Hi. <laughs> This is, we're the uh, English team at Mansfield. We, this is a virtual meeting. It's an opportunity for us to introduce ourselves to you, to talk a bit about what it's like to study English at Mansfield. Um, some, I've been teaching at Mansfield for about 25 years. Um, Ruth is the most recent member of our team. Um, so we all have lots of different experience and words of wisdom, we hope, um, and we hope we'll give you a chance to sort of um, think through uh, what it's like uh, to take a degree in English and specifically at Oxford and specifically at this college. Uh, so I'm going to start just by uh, everyone introducing themselves. My name's Roz, uh, I'm Professor Roz Ballister. I write and publish on 18th century literature. Um, you might have, uh, if you like Jane Austen, you might have encountered my edition of Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility in Penguin Classics. Um, she's one of my favourite authors. Um, I will pass over to others to introduce themselves. Um, Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself next? Yeah, I'm Michelle Mendelssohn. I'm Professor of English and American Literature. I um, am fascinated by Oscar Wilde and I've just published on Oscar Wilde, <laughs> as you can see from the poster behind me. Um, I have a few other books I'm fascinated by. Henry James is another big one for me and I teach Henry James. Also contemporary writing, Alan Hollinghurst, um, and all things 19th and 20th century. Over to you, Chris and Ruth. Chris, do you want sure. to introduce yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah, certainly, yeah, yeah. Um, so, hi, I'm uh, Chris Salamone. Um, I've been teaching at Mansfield for, I guess, since about 2007, I think. Um, and so I teach the Renaissance and the Shakespeare papers, as well as the literary theory papers as well. Um, I'm currently working on, on two things, really. So the big project is, is a book about Shakespearean bits and pieces in the 18th century and how excerpts from Shakespeare get printed in poetry collections um, and also working on, on an essay about uh, an Elizabethan satirist called Thomas Nash for uh, the new Oxford handbook of Thomas Nash and about how his persona gets resurrected in the 1640s um, by a very very funny royalist pamphleteer called uh, John Taylor. Uh, so I kind of work on um, early modern afterlives if you like in the 17th and 18th century. So for the past three years I've been chair of the English faculty board, that means um, I am seconded to the English faculty um, to organise things there and in that time I've been replaced, um, I won't say replaced, replaced. <laughs> replaced uh, by the wonderful Dr Ruth Scobie. Uh, so Ruth, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Ruth. I'm uh, the pretend Ross Ballister um, and <laughs> I've been here now for three years. Um, and I teach the sort of from the Restoration until 1830. So it's actually two papers. It takes you from 1660 to 1760 and then from 1760 to 1830. Um, so a big kind of swathe of, of English literature. Um, my own research is on late 18th century and early 19th century um, culture and especially um, the way that empire is kind of presented, promoted, um, argued about, critiqued in this period. Um, particularly my interest is in celebrity culture and, and a popular forms of writing. So I also have a real interest in Gothic and I've, I've recently written about the way that Gothic is um, kind of enmeshed in the presentation of, of empire and um, non-European cultures in English literature in this period. Brilliant. So um, we thought we'd talk to you a, a little bit about um, study here and what it entails. It's organised in a way whereby uh, there's a shared um, syllabus across the faculties but the colleges decide uh, how to teach it and organise their teaching. We're very lucky in Mansfield that most a lot of our teaching happens in-house by the team that you've just met um, and we see ourselves as as there to develop you as a scholar to help you grow as um, someone who can research independently and write independently and do the very best work that you can do. So we prepare you for central assessments that every college, everyone in every college has to take. Um, the course is structured uh, so that you start in the first year by looking at the most recent work in, in literature and English and the earliest work in literature and English. Um, and then in the middle period, you, you sort of fill in your knowledge. And then by the third year, uh, when you've got a really good mental map of literature in English from the earliest period, from the 17th, 7th century up to the contemporary moment, to writing in English across the globe 
uh, in the Caribbean, in India, as well as in England, um, you then make a decision about what you'd like to specialise in. And in your third year, you get to write your own dissertation under our supervision. Uh, and you work on a special topic, a special option that all of us have, have taught in. Uh, Ruth and I, for instance, have both taught a course on feminist writing. Um, uh, Michelle, you offer a, a central talk course in the third year, don't you? Good year. Some of those courses have included um, courses on the late 19th century, better known as the fin de siècle. Um, I've also taught a course um, looking at Henry James's influence um, through modernism and through to contemporary writers. So let's go around having introduced ourselves and think about one thing we would like you to know. Um, I guess I'd start by saying, because I've been teaching in English at Mansfield for a very long time, I've seen a lot of students come and go, um, and it's always sad to see them go, and it's always exciting to see people arrive and to see how they develop and shape themselves through the three years. I've seen a lot of people, uh, the one thing I, I thought I might mention is just thinking about the kind of careers that people go to from English. People always think that English, um, it, it, or worry about whether English prepares them for any kind of career. Um, I would say over the 25 years that I've been teaching, I've seen students go into every kind of career imaginable. Um, so the obvious things I think people often think about from English is that they go into journalism, they go into media and into media production. A lot go into the museum sector, gallery sector, also entertainment, making television, making radio, that kind of thing. But I've also, uh, uh, quite a large percentage of our graduates go on to take a law qualification and become lawyers. We've had accountants, we've had social workers, lots of teachers, people who go in, into the police service. What English gives you is a capacity to absorb a lot of information and organize it and communicate it. That's the most important thing, being able to communicate that material that you've dealt with and to structure it and to develop an argument around it. And those are skills that every employer wants and they're more and more mm. valuable um, in, the, in the world that we live in. Um, 86% of our graduates uh, are employed uh, within six months of leaving. Um, a lot, quite a large percentage go on to further study as well, something like uh, about a quarter of them go on to take a further qualification. Um, I'm sure others have other insights that they'd like to share with you, so I'll, I'll pass on around. Let's go uh, the other way. Ruth, do you want to start next? Um, not really. All I'd say is kind of the, the ability to think critically um, about, about the world and about the way, particularly that words were kind of central to, to everything that's happening around us. And um, as well as kind of the careers aspect, a lot of our students have an interest in, in kind of politics and in various forms of activism, um, either when they arrive or, or kind of they become interested over the course of their, their undergrad career um, in all sorts of different sort of areas at, at Oxford, they, they kind of have that, um, those opportunities and I think one of the things that English does is kind of give them real um, skills in communication and in kind of the analysis of a situation and the analysis of kind of political discourse too. Yeah I mean that's something actually if I can jump in there I mean the, in, the, in the first year in the uh, literary theory um, course um, which, which I teach I'll be teaching in Michaelmas term um, next year um, I mean it's it's a course that um, on the one hand, it kind of equips you with the kind of toolkit for analysing literature, but on, on the other hand, it's sort of, it, the scope is far greater than that and speaks to actually what Ruth and Ros have, have both said. So it, it helps you scrutinise and, and overturn some of the ingrained assumptions that you have about reading, about literature, but also about, about meaning and identity and some of these, the big questions about the culture that surrounds us. And that ability to scrutinise assumptions, that's a really transferable skill that employees, um, mm. employees are, are really um, looking to see. Yeah, that's true. I think that's one of the things we're quite good at is unpicking the ways in which words shape the world and showing the relationship between the texts on the page and then real world sort of goings on. And so one of the things I like to do in, in the Victorian paper I teach and in the modernist paper is flesh out those parallels between say 
you know, political concepts in the 19th century that you see in John Stuart Mill or you see in, in Ruskin's writing or in Elizabeth Gaskell's or in George Eliot and draw a bridge all the way through to our present moment and think through the different cultural perm permutations that have gone on to, to keep those ideas alive, but also to make them sometimes a little bit dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, by taking this, become a canny reader of that long cultural history that you are already embedded in. The other thing I would say, coming back to what Professor Ballester was saying, is that just looking back to the graduates we have from last year, um, one of them is currently working as a translator in Spain. Um, another is monitoring content for Ofcom, which is a, an interesting thing to be doing. Um, two of them are working in publishing. So they've gone from reading texts to actually shaping the future of literature. And I think that's where what Mansfield offers is, is worth pausing on. Our curriculum is in some ways different from what you'll get at other colleges. I think we all strive to offer a curriculum that's more inclusive, that's more diverse, that's more responsive to the ways in which literature and literary criticism is, is um, evolving today. And on the modernism paper, which I teach, one of the things I like to teach is the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and a lot of students have said that Zora Neale Hurston is still one of their favorites, even after graduation. Um, I also teach a lot of um, women writers, including the um, underappreciated um, Edith Wharton. So all this to say that if your range of interests is broad, um, your, your interests will be met with um, delight here at Mansfield. Yeah, there's a lot of reading um, and you have to enjoy reading, but it's all very directed and guided. And I don't think I've ever had, you know, in 25 years, I've not had a student um, who has um, um, not risen to that challenge actually <laughs> and has always wanted to be doing it so uh, we don't have a set of set texts so we're not here to say to you these are the books that you're going to read um, we give you a lot of choice uh, we help to steer you we sort of say this is really interesting we think you'd like this we hope that in the course of the three years you're going to find things that you are really enjoying and that you want to work on more and that we can help and support you with that and if we don't have the expertise we'll find someone who does because it's a very big faculty at Oxford there's um, about 300 people teaching English at Oxford um, that we can call on to think that our students have a very strong sense of their own identity um, as a as a college that they work very well together. We try and encourage you to work with each other. You're not in a competitive situation with each other. Our teaching largely consists of either a group of about eight or nine of you working on a class together, uh, or you're working in pairs, sometimes singly, giving us your essays uh, and getting feedback on those essays and talking about them. Any subject at Oxford, but particularly English, you will write and read a lot. You'll probably write what do we think? Six essays a term? Yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. plus so classwork. Yeah. yeah, six three thousand word essays a term plus preparation for your classes. That's probably a lot more than you'd be asked to write in other um, universities. But we're not ask we're not asking for sort of polished, publishable research work. We're asking you to keep sort of exercising those muscles. <laughs> keep writing, keep thinking, keep reading, growing your knowledge, trying things out. That's one of the things we really like about the tutorial system. You try out something in an essay. If it's not working, we can talk to you about it and you can have another go at trying some, a different way of doing it. Say, in addition to what um, Professor Valster has just said, this idea of having a go is really central to what we do from the moment you come to us for, for interview to the moment you're sitting with us in a tutorial. We want students who are interested in having a go at ideas, at literature, at history. Um, and if that is compelling to you, then do apply. We're not looking for people who've read all of literature. We're looking for people who are interested in reading deeply and thinking deeply and having a go. Mm. Yeah. I mean, speaking to what we've all been saying about sort of um, exercising our, 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 our mental muscles, as it were, and pursuing our own curiosity, um, Michelle just uh, mentioned a student who's now working in, in translation and looking back at that student's trajectory over their, their time at Mansfield, in particular working on Shakespeare with me in their, in their second year. And this is a student who said, you know, I really fancy writing an essay on, on Shakespeare and early Spanish translations. I said, oh, okay, that's fine. I mean, in Shakespeare, for us, you can, do, you can write essays on whatever you like uh, and you, you pick your best to submit as, as a coursework um, portfolio. 
And so they wrote this fantastic essay on, on early Spanish translations. And now, two years later, they are a professional translator. Um, so it all feeds into their, um, as Professor Ballas has said, the kind of intellectual identity that, that you carry with you even after a degree. But the students from that same cohort you just mentioned, um, Dr. Zalamoni, that same cohort you just mentioned um, got into publishing, which is notoriously difficult to break into. Um, and that's where the, the network we offer at, at Mansfield helped, because there are previous students who got into publishing and were attentive to the schemes that are available. So we help our students and we support them as they make the transition from this degree to, you know, the working world. I thought we'd talk a bit to you about the application process because we know you'll be interested in that, concerned about it, anxious about it. Um, so perhaps we should start by saying uh, the interview is the last thing we do in the process, but it is not the only thing we do in the process. And we engage in a very long process of looking at all of the materials that you have been asked to provide and looking at your academic record and your academic career from GCSEs, probably even from before that, from your choices in, in GCSE, uh, through to uh, whatever you've done, whether it's hires or A-levels or IB um, in your um, studies uh, before you come to Oxford. And obviously we're looking for high scores there, uh, but we're also looking at your references and your personal statement to see um, how you are thinking about your studies, what kind of story you're telling us about how you've developed as, as someone with an interest in English literature and language and writing. Mm. Um, we also have, of course, your score in the English literature admissions test, the ELAT, um, which is banded. And all of these things are factored. Um, if you don't do well on one aspect of things, you, other things will often compensate. And we think about that when we look at you in, um, when we look at your overall profile after um, interview. Um, so my one piece of advice would be that if you get an interview and come to Oxford um, for that interview, do not think that anything that you have done has meant um, that you are not going to get a place. An individual thing will not make a difference. We're looking at you in the round. If you don't answer one question well, you've probably answered another very well, as far as we're concerned. So try not to second guess. Try not to get disheartened. Um, as Michelle said, keep having a go. So um, if, some, if something we ask you doesn't work very well in an interview, we'll ask you something else. Or we might think, hmm, didn't handle that so well, but we just love the other things that you've shown us. Um, and that's important to us. So it's about that kind of rounded um, sense of you that we're trying to gather. We're trying to find the best people um, to take this degree. We're not trying to catch anybody out. We're just trying to give you an opportunity to show us how good you are. Um, and Every year, we're enormously impressed by the people that we see, and there are hard decisions to make. So the other thing to say probably is if you don't get a place, um, you are probably doing amazing work, and you will get to go to a great university, and you will complete um, a degree, and you will shine. So please don't um, uh, feel disheartened by the process. We hope you leave at the end of the process feeling uh, like you've learned something, and that you've enjoyed it, and you've enjoyed the encounter with us and the process of preparing the application. Mm. Um, it's always it's always so nice to meet all the applicants during the interview. And I think one of the things that I love to see is a, a genuine hunger for literature. And I think we, that's one of, the, one of the things we ask of our students, see all the way through their degree is that they maintain, maintain that hunger. And, and one of the things I often get asked at open days is, so if you're looking for that sort of, um, that love of literature, what does it actually look like in an in interview? Um, what does that hunger look like? Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose, I mean, as an example, let's say you've read Orwell's Animal Farm or 1984, and you've mentioned it in your personal statement, um, or you've written an, an essay and submitted that to us. Um, we might look to see, have you pushed into that curiosity, into that interest and read his other novels? Um, that, from my perspective, would be evidence of, of a real hunger uh, to pursue that author further. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, or, you know, just following on from what Dr. Salomone has said, you know, have you, has that lit an interest in utopias, dystopias, political fiction, essay writing? Has that connected to anything for you? We're looking for people who have minds that are interested in making connections. Um, that's part of what we're looking for. And, and I think another thing to come back on just in terms of advice to you as you go through this process, with every step of the way you're giving us another piece of information about yourself and we really take all of those pieces together and put them together and make a kind of puzzle which gives us a picture of you so don't worry too much about the interview the interview is just the last piece of that puzzle so that we have a really complete picture of who you are and whether we think you'd be a good fit for this particular place it may be that you'd be a good fit for another place, um, but we, um, we certainly encourage you to uh, try and to apply. And when we, when we use the word fit as well, I, was, I think we would say we, we don't have a model of a particular kind of person. We've seen a huge variety of students through many years. I mean, as, as Professor Barrett says, I mean, we all have our favorite authors. And one of the great things about doing an English degree is that um, Whoever your favourite author is now will probably change mm -hmm. after you are in, into your third year, and you 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 leave um, with maybe four or five favourite authors as opposed, as opposed to one. I think the one of the key things, if you're thinking about um, applying, is um, consider why your favourite author is your favourite author, mm -hmm. and think about that in a critical way. So, can you pinpoint an aspect of their writing, their tone, or uh, an aspect of their writing style that you think is particularly effective. Mm -hmm. um, if you can, if you can do that, then you're halfway there in in in, in being able to think in the way that we want you to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're really looking for people who can get beyond that sort of initial "I like this book" feeling. Well, if you like a book, what makes you what makes you like it? You know, is it the way it's written? Is it beautiful? Is it a good story? Well, what's the structure, and how is the structure pushing the plot forward? I also really like um, like to hate books. And I often confess to students in the first year that I hate Jane Eyre, but I still teach it. Because I think Jane Eyre is, is brilliant and does certain things very brilliantly. But do I like it? No. So we're also interested in things you don't like. And we might explore that in interviews as well. Yeah. And don't feel like we would only be interested in a sort of highbrow, whatever that means, literature we're quite happy and quite capable to talk about you know uh, young adult fiction things like that i mean we, we love um asking questions that makes you think about you know genre and uh and even what it means for for, for us to think of that as, as literature and high literature or low literature how can we destabilize those uh those dichotomies i for instance have just spent quite a lot of the easter vacation reading really trashy folk horror novels um, <laughs> but because I, I kind of like spooky things um but i you know i can still find some literary literary aspects to them that i could would like to discuss um, you're reminding me that in the interviews i did last year with dr scobie there was one candidate we talked to about comic books um which, which I tarted up as graphic novels. Um, but we had an interesting conversation about comic books and their narrative potential. So yeah, to, to Dr. Salamone's point, it's not about highbrow, lowbrow. It's about reading and thinking. So the close reading exercise, I mean, the first thing to say is it isn't, it, that we're not setting you a trap. There isn't, it's not a test in the sense that there's kind of a certain thing that you have to say or a certain thing that you could say that would be wrong that we would kind of go, no, okay, door shut now. Um, what we're looking for is partly just that kind of sense of curiosity and of, of interest and of a desire to kind of unpick what's happening in the poem. Um, and your sort of ability to, to look imaginatively and, um, but also rigorously at a text. So actually looking at the lines and actually kind of telling us what's there and what you can, you can say about them and support it with evidence. Um, and the second thing is, we're not expecting you to come in with a kind of pre-prepared perfect speech about this poem and everything that you could possibly say about it. We're just going to, we're going to ask you what your first ideas are about the poem. And then we're going to probably want to have a conversation about it. So think of this as the beginning of a conversation rather than we've just asked you to do a presentation on this poem you've never seen before. Um, 
usually you'll say something, we'll say something that kind of changes um, or, or kind of might alter how you look at it. We might ask a question that encourages you to look at it in a different way. Um, we just want to kind of start a discussion and we're just interested to see kind of how you're going to react to that and whether you can think a little bit on your feet about kind of, oh, what if this, the poem is, wasn't doing exactly what I thought it was? So if you want to prepare for your interview, it, and it is worth preparing, and it's worth preparing for the English Literature Admissions Test, all tests, you know, it's worth trying before you get into the room. You might want to sort of find yourself a short poem, um, sit with it for 10 minutes, then um, if you've got a helpful friend or a teacher or a parent who will just sit and you can talk through your reading of the poem with them looking at it. So you just try out what that's like for you. So sort of saying, I've read this poem, um, what I think is going on here is this. <laughs> I'm really interested in what's happened here in the middle stanza where the rhyme scheme doesn't seem to be working or where the lines get longer or shorter. We don't need a lot of technical vocabulary. We want that, if you like, it's about that kind of observation. It's sort of seeing something and saying, let me speculate about what's happening here. Um, so do try out, there's a lot of material online on the um, English, on the Oxford website. And once you get to the English uh, faculty website, there's practice tests you can do um, for ELAT. Um, just the business of talking, we, when we will, it is an academic interview. So we're not going to ask you a lot about your hobbies um, <laughs> or your other interests or, or you know, how well you play um, a musical instrument. The things we always do is make sure that you have two interviews. Um, so it's not a, a sort of one moment in the room. There's, another, there's an interv another interview with two different people who may have a completely different experience of you successful um, from Mansfield. Um, so there's lots of other things to entertain your time. If you didn't, if you couldn't, <laughs> along with those two essays you're writing a week or that one essay a week, you're going to be also engaging in a lot of other activity, musical, creative, literary. Um, it's a very busy short uh, period, three short terms with lots and lots happening. The other thing that's worth saying is about the college community, you know, that you'll be studying in these intimate tutorials with um, the tutors you see before you in this um, online introduction, but you'll also be living in college, perhaps, prob most probably, um, and you'll see us in the quad, you'll see your friends in the quad, you'll be eating together, um, there are dinners with us at the start of term, and when you come to Mansfield, you become part of our community, which is really a sort of enlarged family, um, and I think some of the things we've been saying really express the 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 true sentiment that, that this is a community that stays together for a very, very long time beyond your degree even. In year 12 and you're thinking of applying uh, and you are thinking of applying to English, um, we're going to give you our one tip. I would say keep your mind open and flexible. You know, when you're preparing and when, you're, when you come to Mansfield for the interview, when you're in the ELAT, that flexibility, that openness to new ideas, that's one of the things you want to see and um, one of the things we try to cultivate um, um, whilst you're here. Ruth? Uh, well, related to that, I suppose, read, like, read loads. Read, <laughs> not, not, don't just read stuff that you think um, your teachers would want you to read or stuff that's on reading lists or stuff that sort of you think is the kind of thing that, that people who do English literature should read. Um, but do read outside your comfort zone. So have a look. Like Chris was saying earlier, if you if you're interested in a if you enjoy one book by a writer, have a look and see if he's, they've written other stuff that you could read. Um, keep pushing yourself and and be curious and and just read as much as you can. And uh, and and don't feel that anything anything you read is valid. Um, but but keep pushing yourself even during lockdown, because there are so many great resources online that you still have access to. And so when we're saying read more, a good place to go is a website called archive.org, which has a whole host of uh, books, which you can see in their original editions, and you can turn, click, turn the pages online. Um, 
And so it doesn't matter if you don't have a bookcase full of books at home or if your local library isn't stuffed to the gills or indeed if you're in lockdown. Um, as long as you have an internet connection that's relatively stable, um, do cruise around the internet because you'll quickly discover there are these pockets that are rich with a fantastic literature for you to explore. Um, I didn't go to Oxbridge as an undergraduate and I didn't grow up in a family that you know, had a lot of books on the shelf and I'm here. <laughs> So I think that, you know, it's about curiosity, it's about appetite, it's about a real interest in literature and in ideas. I'd put in a special plea for theatre. Um, that Currently, you know, under lockdown, there's an awful lot of theatre available on, um, through your um, screens, NT Live, National Theatre Live, take the time to watch those. I, I'm really, I think, um, speech and performance are really important things and I suppose the other thing I would add to that is practice speaking your thoughts out loud. Thank you so much for listening to us. Um, we hope you enjoy the process of applying to university and we really look forward um, to seeing you. <laughs>